everyone, and welcome to the SFL webinar series. My name is Leah Paul Gashvili, and I'm the director of the SFL webinar series and an executive board member of SFL. We are honored to have Zach Wallace deliver a talk tonight on libertarianism, why liberal libertarian alliances are so important, and how to build bridges to advance liberty. Before we begin, though, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Students for Liberty and the webinar series. Students for Liberty is a 501c3 nonprofit organization run by students and for students dedicated to liberty. We are formed four years ago to serve a previously unfilled niche in our universities, connecting liberty-friendly students with other students, faculty, organizations, and resources to help them advance their ideas and applications of classical liberalism. The resources we offer include free books for student groups, a speaker's network, protest grants, handbooks on running a student organization, tabling kits, leadership training, an academic journal for liberty and society, and our bread and butter conferences. The SFL webinar series is our way of giving you access to the ideas and mentorship and liberty year round from wherever you are. We hold webinars each week to put you in touch with the top mentors and scholars for liberty in the country. For a full list, please visit our website, studentsforliberty.org. Tonight's webinar is with Zach Walls. Zach Walls, a 20-year-old engineering student at the University of Iowa, is the son of a lesbian couple. An Eagle Scout and an Iowa uh, champion debater, he is a recipient of the Paul Mann Youth Activist Award and the Ally for Equality Award from the Human Rights Campaign. His January 2011 testimony before the Iowa House of Representatives, in which he proclaimed the sexual orientation of my parents, has had zero effect on my character, has become an internet sensation, with his video being watched millions of times and has appeared in major media outlets. Zach is the author of My Two Moms, to be published in spring 2012. Um, he currently lives in I Iowa City, Iowa. Just to note, there will be about 25 minutes of Q&A at the end of the webinar. Feel free to type in any questions into the question box. For those interested, this webinar will be recorded and archived on our website in the next few weeks. We'll be sending you more detailed information about Students for Liberty and our upcoming webinars and the follow-up email. And without further ado, I present to you Zach. Hey, thank you very much. I really appreciate the introduction. And uh, it's great to be here tonight. Uh, I'm really excited about this topic. It's something that I personally have given uh, a lot of thought to and something that I have a lot of interest in. Uh, so with that being said, uh, I'm also sure also know that I'm, I'm really looking forward to the Q&A tonight. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to just jot them down. And I'm uh, really looking forward to getting to those too. So with that, uh, I'd like to hop into the background portion of this talk <clears throat> so everybody knows where I'm coming from. Now, uh, I'm, I'm from Iowa. I was born in central Wisconsin, moved to Iowa when I was a little guy. And uh, needless to say, there aren't a whole lot of libertarians out here. Uh, as you might know, you know, obviously Rick Santorum won the Iowa caucuses back in, uh, in January. Uh, the year before that, it was uh, you know, Governor Huckabee. Before that, it was uh, George W. Bush. So Iowa has a, a long history of, on the conservative side, on the right side, uh, putting out these social conservatives and, and rewarding that as due in no small part to the fact that Iowa is a very religious uh, state in the western part of the state. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of very uh, religious and, and social conservative folks out there. And so libertarians just don't get a whole lot of traction, which is kind of an interesting contrast, of course, to the other early caucus state, uh, early primary state, I guess, is uh, New Hampshire, where you do have that, that long libertarian streak out there. So growing up in Iowa and in the Midwest generally, there weren't a whole lot of libertarians in, in and around kind of my, my political life. And needless to say, most of the folks in the national scene wouldn't qualify as libertarians either. So I didn't really have a, a, a personal experience with libertarianism until I got to college. My uh, freshman year, I had an interesting interaction with a, a libertarian on this Tea Party panel for Iowa Public Radio. And I was just in the coffee shop in, in downtown Iowa City working on homework, and there was this live interview in the coffee shop. And, and I got into a, an interesting conversation with this libertarian. He's a, he's a pretty big guy, uh, probably about 6'3", uh, fairly heavy set. He had a you know, full beard, um, kind of kind of cropped, and he had a cowboy hat on. Uh, which, <laughs> I don't know, for some reason kind of struck me, struck me at the time as kind of a quintessential libertarian um, dude. But as I've, I've gotten to know, you know, obviously a lot of people within the libertarian movement, that, that perception is, has shifted. 
Um, and, and so I got to talking with, with uh, this fellow after this Tea Party interview, and he seemed like he was the one guy who, um, when there was a question about marriage equality, which, uh, as I kind of mentioned in the intro, is a very important issue uh, for me, he was the one guy who gave a, a response that was supportive. Uh, of, of full uh, equality under the law when it comes to issues of civil marriage, and so that was that was kind of a, a breakthrough for me. We got to talking a little bit, and and I had, I had been exposed to the Ron Paul candidacy a little bit. And I'll get into that in, in just a second. But uh, to that point, I hadn't seriously considered any any libertarian ideas. And after this conversation with him, I was kind of um, op open to it a little bit more. Uh, and then after my my talk for the Iowa House Judiciary Committee back in January 2011, uh, kind of blew up uh, online. I started talking with some more folks in the libertarian movement who were uh, young folks and, and really excited, and, and Students for Liberty was one of those organizations. And I was actually invited to uh, participate in the 2012 conference uh, this year, and I, I gave a talk on a, on a, a, a similar subject um, back then, and, and I had a great time, and it's, it's really good to be here. And that would be my mom's phone just ringing in the background, so please ignore that for a minute. Um, so, so, yeah. Uh, the introduction that I had to libertarianism, and you have to remember that this is coming from a liberal's perspective. You know, I saw on the Facebook event page that there was somebody um, who, who was talking about how, uh, you know, you know, I'm, I'm a liberal, and that's true. You know, and, and I don't think that that's a dirty word. Um, and and so yeah, you know, it, it's it's very true. Uh, and and so my initial perspective and my initial kind of first interaction with uh, libertarianism, generally speaking, was the Ron Paul. Uh, candidacy in 08. Now, I, I know there are probably a lot of uh, folks on, online who would um, disagree with Ron Paul's claim that he's a libertarian. Um, probably some, some folks who would support it. Uh, but that's kind of indicative, just more generally, of some internal incongruencies. But that's how he presented himself, and that was how, how I interpret it. And so, at first, I was kind of excited. This is like a, a new idea. And then um, I, I started wondering, well, who's going to benefit the most uh, from his policies? And so this was uh, this this kind of classic situation uh, where you had you know, maybe a bleeding heart liberal kind of wondering about the effects of in effects of income tax income tax cuts and, and a flat tax and, and kind of that whole thing. And my conclusion was that it was going to be you know, pretty much just positively affecting those who are already doing well. Um, and then you to say this was a fairly brief interest for me um, at, the, at that point in time. Uh, needless to say, this was not a, a full experience, and, and I didn't really get to learn uh, as much about libertarianism as I would later. Um, but it struck me initially as a set of beliefs that would uh, exclusively help people who are already doing well off. Um, this this changed later, but and, and I like to say now, um, after kind of this experience with Ron Paul and the subsequent experience with uh, this fellow in this coffee shop, you could say that I was libertarian curious. Um, and, and I was open to you know thinking about libertarian ideas a little bit more, and, and kind of considering uh, some, some thoughts of, of Austrian economics. Um, and, and so, like I said, I did a little bit more research, and I thought that the social and security aspects of the libertarian party pl uh, platform were right on. Their social and security uh, planks were you know talking about a need to kind of restrict government in, in, in its interference in, in people's personal lives, but then also to kind of pull back from some of this uh, military adventurism that we've seen uh, over the last decade and continue to see today under the Obama administration. Um, but I was also immediately struck, and this was something that I was reaffirmed, um, a belief in which I was reaffirmed when I went to the International Students for Liberty Conference in, in January, extraordinarily intelligent people in the libertarian movement, really, really well read. And I wish I could say that that was true for uh, most of my uh, political allies that, that I, I'm with. And, and the fact of the matter is that I think probably your average self-identified libertarian has simply done more research into his or her political beliefs uh, than a liberal or a conservative. Uh, and, and to be honest, I, I couldn't necessarily give you a good explanation as to why that's the case, but it's just something that, and albeit this is anecdotally, um, that, that I've experienced, something that, that I think is very admirable. That being said, I was also uh, struck by, and this is, I, ha I have to kind of reaffirm this was a perception that, you know, some of these questions of privilege uh, were, were dismissed just kind of as like a granted um, uh, by some, some people I met. Uh, who self-identified as libertarian, and that was a little frustrating, um, you know, because even though you know I, I am a straight white male and I have an awful lot of privilege in that respect, I, I certainly am very 
um, cognizant of the effects that a privilege uh, you know does and, and does not have um, on a person's life when it comes to you know minority status um, in that respect there were a lot of challenges that I faced having having lesbian parents but then also a lot of uh, you know lessons that I learned from that and so that's kind of a question that myself um, you know that I continue to grapple with myself uh, but it's something that I, I want to get into in, in just a little bit more uh, detail in just a little bit here um, but you know I, I so I found myself uh, this in here in 2011 um, you know having been exposed to some libertarian ideas um, being at a place myself where I, I was definitely supportive of some uh, libertarian policies and, and very excited about the possibility of working with uh, some folks who who consider themselves to be primarily um, you know focused on on liberty and enhancing and protecting freedoms and, and what have you I'm very excited about seeing where we go from here and one of the other reasons that I'm particularly excited to be working with some libertarians and figuring out ways that we can work together is that I think a lot of uh, conservatives in this country especially younger conservatives in our generation uh, and certainly in the generation that's going to follow ours uh, are, are going to be definitely more of a libertarian slant, L libertarian slant, uh, insofar as I think a lot of the social conservatism that we have experienced over the last probably 50 years in this country is, is really on the decline, as we've you know had you know the the introduction of you know quote unquote deviance to the pop culture into the mass media, but well, also when you have the rise of the internet and the fact that today we have this method of communication that allows us to circumvent these traditional barriers to this really kind of in-depth conversation and, and communication that we can all do, you know, and we're all sitting here on our computers having, the, having this conversation. It's actually a, a great example of that, I think. As you, as you have the internet, you can break through some of the stereotypes, myths, and, and misconceptions that are the reason that social conservatism uh, has, has continued to last as long as it has. And the more uh, information that people get, I think the more we're going to break through that, and the more you'll have people who, you know, were raised in the conservative tradition, understanding that perhaps the, the social conservatism that they were raised with or formerly espoused isn't feeling quite right anymore, and they'll probably be leaning towards a more libertarian slant um, and a libertarian uh, point of view. So you you might have uh, so the guy on the right here. Um, is Mitch Daniels, the governor of Indiana, and he is, uh, you know, a self-identified moderate Republican, uh, in some senses of the word. When it comes to economic policy, he's awfully conservative, um, but he's called a moderate uh, because he's put forth this idea for a, a truce on social issues, so we can focus attention on the economic issues. This is a particularly popular, or was a particularly popular idea during the early days of the Obama administration, uh, because we had, you know, a president who was working within some constraints uh, at the national level uh, but also there were you know it was still a, a a really bad economic climate and so the thought was let's let's put aside um, our disagreements on the economic stuff so we can focus on the social stuff and, and in my mind this seems like a bad idea for a, at least one major reason when it comes to economics um, this is guesswork there's obviously, uh, you know, centuries of research that has been conducted into this field, uh, but but it remains an imperfect science. And I think any economist would tell you that. Any economics major certainly, uh, I, I would hope, would agree with me. You know, as far as you look at an economy being the sum total of the people in it, and people, as as I think we all know, are not exactly the most rational beings. Uh, we occasionally um, exhibit bouts of rationalism, but I think for the most part. Uh, I, I think people are generally speaking irrational, um, and, and perhaps I'm, I'm alone in this, but at, at that point it seems to me that um, economics uh, is, is going to mostly be guesswork. But when it comes to ethics and these questions that are traditionally behind uh, these social issues, these are pretty empirical. These are very, these are rational, these are very logical, and you can sit down and you can really work through these questions and, and break it through. Uh, you know, and, and LGBT, LGBT status and kind of the issues surrounded is exactly one of those one of those instances where you can see these very uh, you know obviously I think anybody who is looking at ethics in terms of uh, what is right and what is wrong, absent some divine intervention, will find that you know there is obviously going to be nothing inherently unethical uh, in being in a person who is LGBT. 
I think that's probably a truth that's self-evident for most of us who, who would subscribe to that school of thought. So when it comes to this, this question of having a truce on the social issues, so we can focus on the economic issues, I can't help but think that this, this is a dangerous idea uh, because we are, as uh, liberals and as libertarians, trying to call a, a truce on, on the one area where we know we are correct. Now, when it comes to economics, we can think that we're probably like 90% of the way there, but at the end of the day, there's always going to be a, a little bit of doubt about the effects of our economic policy. But when it comes to something like social policy and the effects uh, and the reasoning behind our, our positions in that field, I think we're going to be on much more solid ground. And so this is one of the reasons why I think leftist libertarian alliances, um, and Star Wars fans, please excuse my use of the Rebel Alliance symbol here, um, are going to be particularly important uh, in the future. They're going to be important in at least, I think, uh, four key areas, and then obviously with the question marks down here, we're open uh, to, to many more areas and of areas where we can kind of collaborate and, and move uh, you know, politics and then, I guess, you know, hearts and minds in, in a, a better direction generally. So when it comes to electoral politics, there are obviously two key areas here with the primaries and the general elections. Now, obviously, I, I don't think a leftist libertarian party is going to arise anytime soon. There's still going to be a fundamental disagreement on a lot of the economic policies. But when it comes to, there's actually a great example happening right now down in Texas. With Lamar, Lamar Smith, he's one of the uh, co-sponsors, and I don't want to say co-authors of SOPA, the Stop Online Pri Piracy Act that I, I'm guessing probably most people on, on this webinar have heard of. And there were there are a lot of um, liberals, actually, who are lending support to Lamar Smith's libertarian challenger. Because the fact is that you're never going to elect a liberal out of a district uh, like his in Texas. That's just not going to happen. Uh, so you have to, you know, and this is kind of the question that, and, and really I think this kind of what's at the heart of the matter anyway, is if you're going to have somebody from that district who's not going to agree with you any percent of the time, let's say he'll agree with you zero percent of the time when it comes to Lamar Smith, or a libertarian who's going to agree with you 20 to 40 percent of the time, obviously I think liberals will have a self-interest in supporting that libertarian candidate and getting somebody on board who's going to stand up to something like SOPA uh, and PIPA, uh, somebody who's going to be willing to take a stand of protecting uh, civil rights, uh, making sure that we're not doing you know, this kind of reckless uh, foreign policy, that sort of thing. So uh, there's certainly room, I think, for these kinds of alliances to emerge when it comes to a primary and then even to a general election. Uh, now, obviously, a liberal supporting a, a libertarian versus a Democrat is probably not going to happen. Uh, but if it were even some kind of you know, uh, third-party libertarian candidate versus a conventional Republican candidate, I would hope uh, that there would be at least some liberals who would be willing to consider uh, the libertarian candidate. And obviously, this is all true on, on, on the flip side as well. There are clearly some Democrats who are who are much more statist than others. Um, you know, there there are obviously varying levels of that. You know, and there, and there are some uh, Democrats who are very much opposed to um, a lot of the the statist policies that have been put forth and, and kind of supported by mainstream Democrats over the years. Obviously, Dennis Kucinich is uh, one of the most prominent ones that comes to mind. But there are a number of folks in the Senate as well. Uh, so when it comes to kind of general support. I think we'd all be more happy supporting candidates who are going to agree with us 100% of the time. But if it comes down to this real politics situation where you're making a decision between uh, either somebody who's going to vote with you 20% of the time or 0% of the time, I would hope that we'd be willing um, to, uh, to lend our support to, to the candidates who will agree with 20% of the time. And then when you look at ballot measures, this is uh, something that you know, we're, we're seeing increasingly. Uh, Colorado's actually got a, a, an interesting ballot measure coming up where you're going to have hopefully have some... Uh, some liber uh, libertarian support for something that I believe was put forth by the Democratic Party out there uh, to decriminalize cannabis use. This is uh, one, one instance in particular where I think you're going to see uh, increasingly um, the best opportunities for le leftist libertarian alliances to exist when it comes down to these specific issues and we don't necessarily have to worry about this whole pick your poison thing with electoral politics. When it comes to a ballot measure, obvious, obviously this is a yes or no, an up or down vote. So these alliances are going to be much more natural, I think, and, and much easier to, to organize and then uh, support um, through that process. And finally, when it comes to constitutional amendments, there are some kind of interesting things going on. This is actually exactly what we were looking at here uh, in Iowa. Uh, this was House Joint Resolution 6. That was the, uh, the legislation that I was speaking against and that 
the video um, that is, is in some ways responsible for me being here tonight. Um, this was a constitutional amendment to uh, restrict and reverse the Supreme Court decision um, in 2009 and to re restrict marriage to only one man and one woman. And so and obviously these constitutional amendments will obviously be a case-by-case -case basis, um, but to have this kind of constitutional amendment that was explicitly targeting a single uh, class of people, uh, to use the Constitution in uh, to wield it as this sword uh, as opposed to a shield um, was, was very troubling on a, on a number of levels, not just because it affected my moms, but also because this would have been the first time ever that the Iowa Constitution would be used to discriminate and deprive rights from a single class of people. Uh, it was something that I, that I thought was a huge uh, source of, of uh, you know, controversy, to be quite frank. And then uh, finally, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to student and, uh, and other political groups, I think that we'll we'll see some um, some alliances here, some cooperation here. But you know, the, these are this is going to be relatively small. I think that the biggest function that these kinds of groups, student or otherwise, can play is in building relationships and in building trust between uh, leftists and libertarians. And, and I'll I'll get into that in just I think the next slide here on, as to why specifically that relationship building is important. Um, but I, I think that's a, uh, a, a fundamental role that we're, we're going to see here that's, that's very important. And finally, uh, you know, with the, these question marks, I'm, I'm open, and, you know, and I would love to, be, to hear everybody else uh, on the webinar hear your ideas for other ways and, and uh, possibilities that um, leftists and libertarians can work together, now, whether that means like writing or, or working together on, on some kinds of articles. or, or uh, you know, I, I'm really open to, to a lot of possibilities here, and, and I'm looking forward to hearing people's uh, ideas later on. Now, obviously, um, there are going to be a lot of obstacles to cooperation. I think you, all you'd have to do would be to look at the uh, the event uh, for this on Facebook to see a lot of people's initial hesitancy, uh, host, open hostility, um, you know, kind of skepticism as to to an alliance like this and why it would ever be useful or, or why it'd be one worth engaging in in the first place. Now, I think this is indicative of a deep distrust stem, stemming uh, from this kind of fundamental disagreement that liberals and, and libertarians have on a lot of these economic issues. Uh, I don't need to tell anybody who, who's on this webinar that there are some very, very real differences between people on the left and libertarians uh, when it comes to economic policy, uh, when it comes to health care policy. These are very real uh, disagreements. And it's important to not you know, kind of cast those uh, by the side. And, and it's important to be honest and, and, and open about these disagreements. Uh, because if we can't be open and honest about these disagreements, then there's no way that we'll be able that we'll ever be able to build the kind of relationships that we'll need uh, in order to, to work together on issues that don't involve economic policy. Now, I think there will probably be uh, a few issues within the realm of economics where uh, people on the left and libertarians see some overlap and are willing to work together. Uh, but, but these are going to be far and, and few, um, few and far between is the phrase I was looking for there. Um, in my experience, most liberals that I've spoken with think libertarianism is a great idea in theory. It's a good idea on paper. It's um, kind of this interesting examination in, in hypotheticals, um, but most liberals seem to think that it's, it's not something that is actually going to work or have the effects that its proponents think it's going to have. So there's a disconnect there. There's also, I think more fundamentally, uh, a, a difference in how people on the left and how people who identify as libertarians value liberty versus equality. I think you could probably make a good argument that most questions of public policy in this country have to do with where you find on this continuum of valuing a maximal liberty versus valuing maximal equality. Now, I'd expect probably most people uh, on this webinar lean much, much further uh, to the left towards liberty here than, than to equality, um, uh, as, as opposed to uh, you know the other way around, uh, hence libertarianism, I guess. <laughs> Um, so, so that makes a lot of sense in my mind. Uh, and I think you, you'll also find there are people uh, who identify as liberals who are probably a little bit closer to that liberty side than you might expect um, you know, a government worshipping statist to be, um, like myself. <laughs> but um, there, are, there are obviously uh, some, some real disagreements about where people fall on that, on that continuum as well. And then uh, finally, it's been my experience, and I have to admit, you know, straight up, that this is completely anecdotal, but in my experience, libertarians tend to be much more principles-oriented than liberals. What I mean by that is that uh, a lot of libertarians who, who I've had the pleasure of, of conversing with seem to be very, uh, very committed to their principles. 
Uh, and part of the reason, I think, is that when it comes to an idea like liberty, uh, there, there's not necessarily a whole lot to it. It's, it's very simple, uh, the idea that you should maximize liberty. When it comes to something like equality, however, that's, it's like it's so much more complicated and there's so many more things that you'd have to do. This is why like there's a huge difference between the size of a state that maximizes liberty and the size of a state that maximizes equality. Uh, and one of the reasons, obviously, that there are so many inefficiencies when it comes to a state that maximizes equality over all else. Uh, and you look at any kind of major statist government um, that professes any way to maximize uh, equality, or whether or not it's actually the case is kind of up for debate. Um, but in my experience, you could also find another axis to, on which to evaluate probably most actors in the political realm. And in my experience, anyways, um, many libertarians tend to be more principled as opposed to uh, pragmatic um, when it comes to ad addressing these challenges. And this, like, again, I have to say, this isn't a universal um, observation, but this has been, uh, in a lot of ways, the observations that I've had over the, the, the last few months. And then finally, I think this is indicative in, of internal incongruity uh, among both sides. You know, obviously, I remember actually at, at my at my talk at the International Students for Liberty conference, I asked some questions about what people thought um, about markets and, and their kind of perceptions of markets and, and of people. And even within that room, where you, you might think there was this kind of homogenous group of, of self-identified libertarians, there, there obviously was not uh, perfect congruity. There was not perfect, uh, you know, perfectly held set of beliefs that everybody subscribed to. And I thought that was actually something that's very admirable, um, where you, you have a, an ideology in a movement in which there is room for this debate. I think it's very important. It's one of the, the reasons that I am very excited about libertarianism generally is the chance to have kind of this new debate that a lot of um, you know the Democratic Party and the Republican Party have settled a long time ago. And there's not a really a whole lot of fanaticism in either of those parties. And there's not a whole lot of change. Um, but within the libertarian movement, there is this possibility for people's uh, minds to kind of be exposed to these new ideas and to, to take part in a conversation that this this country hasn't had in a very long time, and I think that's a, that's a great thing. I also do see a lot of overlap um, when it comes to leftist libertarian alliances. I know obviously over here on the left we got things that we're going to probably both support, things on the right uh, that we'll probably both oppose. Um, and, and you can kind of go down the line and you can look at some of these um, you know, various policies and, and see if they are something that you do or do not support or do or do not oppose. Um, and, and so these, these are some of the general observations uh, that I've had. Now, personally, if you look uh, down here on, on the opposed column, I know this governmental business collusion is, is kind of a, a big one that steps out uh, in my mind because I know that there are a lot of liberals who think that libertarians are, are just um, a bunch of people who want big business and support big business. What a lot of people on the left fail to realize is that it is incredibly hard to have these big businesses if you don't have government stepping in and making these rules and regulations that prevent um, kind of the innovation and, and the business development that that you need to, to keep these markets free and open. And so I think without without realizing it, a lot of liberals have accidentally um, supported policies uh, that have, have wound up in this collusion of you know government and business. And so I want to give you a good example. I think Fannie and Fannie, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are, are two great examples of this. Um, without realizing it, perhaps, you know, uh, liberals who perhaps valued equality more than liberty um, accidentally wound up supporting policies that, that wound up leading a, or contributing in no small part to this, this housing bubble where you had obviously the, these loans being made and then that were, that were bad, bad loans. And, and that wasn't the fault of Fannie Mae uh, or Freddie Mac at all. But then after these loans were, were made, and that was a failure of the loan officers, in my opinion anyway, uh, you had these these loans being passed off on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which were in theory, um, you know, more people owning their own home. Like, what's wrong with that? Um, well, obviously, what's wrong with that is that these people couldn't afford these homes. They were buying homes that were irresponsibly large. And again, this was, you know, maybe a good example of people being irrational actors. And so, I think it's um, very important for all of us uh, to make sure that when we are we're having these conversations and trying to build these relationships, to 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 presume the best. Um, you know, I, I was I described as a government warshipper earlier this afternoon, um, and you know that's like okay, you get to call me a name and you get to feel good about yourself, but like where does that leave us, right? Um, and, and like, do you really think that like I have an idol of like uh, the Communist Manifesto sitting on my bookshelf that I like pray to every morning? Like, do you actually believe that, or are you just like trying to score points to make yourself feel good? Um, you know, and I think those answers are probably self-evident. 
So when when we do try to, you know, and this isn't even just when it comes to building alliances, but this is kind of just a general when we're acting in this in these political spaces. I think it's important uh, to try and understand that, you know, there are differences of opinion, but at the end of the day, I think most of us really, generally speaking, want the same thing. We just have different ideas about how to get to it. And I think that that's what these alliances are, are probably best suited for, is identifying channels in which, despite our differences ideologically on, on certain political avenues, Identif using these alliances to identify avenues that we can share on our uh, on our way to the pursuit of, of society where we have equal opportunity, uh, where we have people who are free and have a liberty to operate uh, in their own spaces and in their own capacities as best they see fit without intervention by the government, without intervention by business, uh, and and have the the possibilities that I think we all we all want to see. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there are some important uh, things that we have to recall when it comes to making sure that we're not accidentally building these bridges to nowhere. Um, that was, uh, never mind. So, when it, when <laughs> there was, um, I, I think market failure is a very interesting thing. And, and in my mind, I've, I've, I've studied some economics classes at, at the University of Iowa. Um, and I should also just, I don't think I have to disclose this, but I am, oh, um, but I am a, uh, a strident capitalist. Um, I am, you know, I'm a small business owner. I actually own two small companies that I've been uh, involved with uh, for a long time. And so needless to say, uh, you know, I, I do support free markets. Um, and I think it's important to, to kind of note how, this, how market failure uh, is perceived, uh, depending on your political ideology. I think there are probably a, a lot of folks who, you know, I, I think if you study economics, you know that markets occasionally fail, even perfect markets, for, for whatever reason. Um, and, and the reason, I guess, is, is not some mysterious thing is that markets are the sum of people, and people aren't perfect. Um, and so, you know, in my sense of the mind, you know, I, I think of market failure, um, but I don't necessarily just think of you know externalities or, or, or bad pricing or, or monopolies or, or what have you. I also think of things like discrimination um, on the basis of you know gender, race, class, uh, sexual orientation, physical ability, etc., uh, as an example of market failure. Insofar as you have um, people you know behaving irrationally depriving the market of certain uh, resources on, on an irrational basis and so um, in, in my eyes that's market failure so that's one of the reasons why I think as a liberal I would not be opposed to a policy like the Civil Rights Act where you had the government stepping in and telling businesses that they couldn't make these kinds of decisions um, based on, on uh, identity in this case of, of race now, this was an interesting conversation that, that we got to have uh, during the Q&A after my talk at the ISFL, uh, ISFLC back in February. Um, and I think it's a conversation that's probably better suited to a live audience than, than a webinar. Um, so I, I don't want to necessarily delve into this too much tonight. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons having the government step in and on false like that, in my eyes, was that, um, you know, I, I think it's important for people to, to have a sense of... Um, this this uh, question of what is and what is not legal because I think there are a lot of people who because they're lazy um, have this kind of synonymous definition of legality and morality and obviously um, I think probably most people in this webinar would would not be of that opinion that there is you know uh, this this direct correlation between um, what is moral and what is legal and, and I would hope that none of us are are, are falling into that conceit. Um, but I think for a lot of people who simply don't take the time to think through these issues uh, or what have you, um, actually making sure that, that there are that the policies that we have in the books are moral, I think, are, are very important. Um, next is this conversation of, of prejudice and, and privilege. Uh, you know, I, I think these are these are very common, or privilege, and, and certainly is, is a common term uh, used in liberal circles, uh, specifically when you come to the academic level of, of liberalism and, and leftism generally. Um, and, you, and you look at the various identities that, that have more privilege uh, than not. Um, and I, I know that there are a lot of people, or this has been my experience an anecdotally anyway, uh, within the libertarian movement who are uncomfortable having uh, these conversations. In my experience, part of that has been because there are a lot of people in the libertarian movement who have an awful lot of privilege. Um, it, and it kind of makes sense that the, the policies that you know support limited governmental in intervention, maximizing liberty as opposed to equality, who, well, you know, I think is also doing better than average. It's certainly uh, some ideas that I'm very sympathetic to. But I think it's important to have these conversations about privilege and how those affect our lives, our politics, and our interactions with one another if we're going to, you know, accurately and, and honestly talk about these relationships that people on the left and libertarians can, can enter into. 
Uh, that being said, I think it's also important to look at uh, the government's role and or purpose. And obviously this is going to be different for, I think, every single person. There's some people who believe that government has zero legitimate role, has zero legitimate purpose, that all taxes uh, are oppression. And there are also there are people who are, who are not quite as, uh, you know, not, not quite, don't view government in quite that light. There are also going to be people who, who view government as a great equalizer, making up for, um, you know, these, these inequalities that exist beyond people's individual choices. Um, and and is a, something by which we know we can quote we redistribute wealth or, or what have you and obviously I hope you know a bunch of people on this webinar just cringed. Um, it's an idea that seems very uh, kind of scary to me, um, but it is, is something that uh, I think we need to be aware of that this, there are going to be some dis disagreements there. Um, and then as I already mentioned, kind of this dichotomy between liberty and, and equality, um, and then and also you know principle and pragmatism. Um, there are these kind of two axes. I don't think they're necessarily perpendicular, um, but there are definitely two kind of parallel axes where your your own identity will probably fall kind of on either of these continuums. Um, you know, from uh, you know diehard objectivist to probably diehard communist, and like Rorschach from Watchmen to like Rahm Emanuel. Uh, so these are kind of the the extremes when everybody having these conversations. To be honest about where you fall on those continuums. Uh, personally, I think I'd, I'd probably be, you know, much more closer to pragmatism. Maybe one of the reasons why I'm interested in these alliances in the first place. Um, but then I'm also, you know, I'd probably be, uh, I mean, I'd probably be right in the middle when it comes to liberty, equality, maybe leaning just a little bit towards equality. I really am a passionate believer in making sure that we have a society where there is abundant opportunity. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, Opportunity and, and liberty are obviously two things to go together. I think we just got to like figure out the best ways to maximize those for everybody. Um, and then when it comes to forming partnerships, um, I think it's it's very important that we sit down and we, and we define a goal and we have an explicit idea of what we want this partnership to do, where we think it's headed, uh, and, and have a, a crystal clear understanding of why we are all sitting at this table together. I think once you've had that goal, you're going to have to build trust in, in the relationship, um, and it is kind of like dating. You know, um, if you cheat. On, on your you know your partner that's not okay um, and that's definitely like criteria for for breaking it off now if you're being open and honest about you know maybe seeing other people that's something else altogether and I think you can get some suggestions on how you want to go about doing that um, but that's not really uh, I guess the point here the point is that you want to build trust and, and have these relationships that are that are worth something and, and that have a real meaning to those who are involved with them after you got this then you can start building uh, your strategies your tactics your plan of action um, whether that means electing a, a libertarian candidate in a conservative district, or identifying, or you know, uh, electing a anti-authoritarian liberal in a democratic district, um, you know, ma making sure that you're you're you know formulating effective uh, strategies um, and then tactics. I think it's gonna, it's it's very important. And then obviously you want to go ahead and execute that plan. Then once that's done, you can wrap up and, and have some resolution and figure out what worked, what didn't work. Um, you know, kind of what you want to do, uh, do you think you might be able to work together on uh, and, and really get some results. Now, um, I think it's important that, that we, we have the conversation, so to speak, because the fact of the matter is that disagreements will arise. Um, and if you're very careful, you know, yeah, unless you're very careful, some of these might kind of devolve into name calling or, or just kind of, you know, uh, factors that would be working against us. Um, like I said, you know, some of these disagreements are going to be very bitter, very fundamental to you know who we are as people. Um, you know, I think it's it's not probably uncommon for some liberals to view uh, libertarians as, as selfish or or what have you, and then it's also not uncommon for libertarians to view liberals as people who want to use the state to make up for their own laziness um, or or any other kind of a personal attribute. Uh, that would kind of result in them not fulfilling their full potential, so to speak, um, and and like and that's okay. Uh, that's not necessarily something that we need to be scared of. Um, we just need to understand, I think, as, as people, that um, you know we might say something that we don't necessarily mean, but or or, or either way, you know, you, you got to be careful. Um, but know that these disagreements are there; they're real, but they're not why we're here. We're we're not here because we have disagreements. We're here because we have similarities. Um, so if you can sit down and you can really have these conversations and talk it through, um, you know, get a couple of drinks or, or your recreational drug of choice, 
um, and and indulge and, and just have these conversations, you know. And maybe they won't they don't have to be bitter. You know, I, I've had some extraordinarily interesting conversations with with libertarians about uh, not just political philosophy, but about economics. Um, I've I've had <laughs> some great conversations about monetary policy. Um, over Five Guys Burgers when I was in D.C. It was like the most unexpected thing, but it was great. And, and the reason that we were able to have those conversations is because we all brought an open mind. And even though I don't think any of us really walked away with differences of, you know, in our, in our own mindset, I think we probably all walked away with a better understanding in each other's mindset. And that's really important. And then, as I mentioned, you know, respect is really the ultimate currency in these conversations. And this is really cheesy graphic here, but it's really true, right? You, when it comes to respect, you have to give it in order to get it from other people. And if you're not willing to give other people uh, the respect, you know, and respect their inherent worth and dignity, uh, respect that their ideas that they have are, are not just because um, they're exclusively self-interested and, and, and recognize that they have their ideas, um, you know, probably for, for good intentions, just like you do. Um, I think that's very, very important. And then there, there have been some questions that I've got, ever gotten um, from people who are, who are interested in, in this kind of topic of, of leftist libertarian alliances. Um, and these are things that I think I've already kind of mentioned in passing in, in my talk so far tonight. But, you know, there, there are some people who are extraordinarily skeptical of the idea in the first place, and that's okay. Um, I mean, I, we probably won't sit down and, and plot out um, how to, you know, end the drug war in Iowa, but, you know, if, if that's, you know, if you don't trust me enough to have this conversation, that's all right. You know, I'm not going to take it personally. Um, you know, again, if we can't agree, you know, that that's okay. You know, the worst thing that happens is you is you walk away having had a couple conversations with some people. Uh, not the end of the world in, in my mind. And then when it comes to, you know, why uh, are these alliances important? Well, you know, here's the thing. Uh, these alliances are important. And, and I guess pragmati pragmatism generally, getting things done, is important only insofar as you actually want results. I want to say that one more time. These are important only insofar as we want results. If you're interested in, in simply, um, you know, being a, a card-carrying member of a certain ideology, you know, whether that's uh, being, you know, and, and look, I, I got to be honest, I've met an awful lot of people on on my team, um, you know, a lot of liberals who are extraordinarily frustrating to work with, who are extraordinarily stubborn, are completely unwilling to change their mind, um, and and that to me is is just, you know, honestly, even more frustrating sometimes than, than just shooting the shit with the conservative. Because um, they're kind of, you know, the, the liberal who won't change his mind is, in, in my eyes, kind of missing the point about what being a liberal is all about. Um, and, and so, and then it's true on the other side as well. You know, if you're only interested in, in you know, uh, working with other people who are like-minded to curtail the state's authority um, and refuse to work with somebody who supports a state intervention in any cases, well, then this probably isn't going to be your top cup of tea. Uh, but in my eyes, that seems to me to, to be kind of a, um, an egotistical activity to engage in, you know, this, this kind of self-importance where your principles and your ideas are, are more important than um, the society that you live in, uh, and, 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 and even like your fellow libertarians, um, you know, trying to actually make the world more conducive to such uh, ideas. Um, but I'm willing to compromise even a little bit for a longer-term gain. Seems, seems, in my mind, to be um, not uh, a, a good strategy. And then finally, as a liberal, I think it's extraordinarily important that we have these alliances because an emboldened libertarian movement gives, uh, I think, both disgruntled conservatives and you know, kind of ineffectual liberals a place to kind of get involved in the political process again. Uh, you know, that was one of the reasons why you know, there were a lot of people on the left who like chastised the Tea Party out of hand. But I thought that it was this incredible opportunity where you, you had a lot of Americans who, for whatever reason, hadn't been active uh, politically for a very long time, getting back involved in the political process. And, and in my eyes, that's always a good thing, even if they're going to vote against you. Um, and so to have more people participating and then to have uh, libertarianism have been, in, in a lot of ways, a, a, a key part uh, of the Tea Party is talking about the role of limited government. Um, even in the economic realm, I thought that was great uh, because there are, as, and I mentioned this earlier, um, there are a lot of young conservatives who are very frustrated with kind of their elder leaders, um, and I think it's giving those young people an outlet and a place to be, um, so they don't just have to like kind of sit on that disgruntledness and then like become old bitter people who are just like um, those older people from before uh, is really important. And so if, if young conservatives who disagree on social issues 
with uh, their party leaders or, or what have you can get involved and express and espouse those ideas and find camaraderie in the libertarian movement, I think that's fantastic. Uh, and, and, and I guess there are um, some, some things to remember, um, and this is kind of a, a, a personal um, thing that I was just trying to remind. There's no such thing as being 100% sure. Uh, you know, I'm a skeptic. I, I think if I had to pick an ideology, it would be kind of some blend, or ideological label, it would be some blend of like a skeptical pragmatist, um, classical liberal with a touch of um, regulation as is needed. Um, but, you know, I, I think as part of that skeptical label, it's important that I, I keep an open mind about uh, where we are uh, headed uh, politically, what the impacts of my policies that I'm advocating for, uh, what kind of the effects those are going to have, and, and kind of that whole thing. It's also important to remember that with any kind of relationship, uh, with these relationships in particular, we're going to get out of them what we put into them. Um, I think that there are going to be times where you know, you might have one side putting in a whole lot more effort than the other, and that's just not going to be a satisfying relationship for anybody. Um, and so if, if both sides are willing to sit down and really kind of make the commitment and have these conversations that we really need to have, then I think they're going to be a great conversation, the relationships are going to be great, and the effects hopefully will be great as well. I think it's also important for everybody to remember, whether you're the one who's participating in the, in the organizational alliance, or you're the one who's orchestrating it, or 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 whatever your role is, the, you know, the purpose of the alliance is, is not to convert somebody to your way of thinking. This alliance is, is not about you. Uh, it's not about uh, anybody, and, and it's about you know getting the results that we, we want to get. Um, so kind of making sure that we can like detach um, that tend you know, and, and I think we all have this tendency internally to want people to agree with us, and so we might find ourselves accidentally slipping into this kind of want uh, to convert people, and I think that's natural, and I think we just have to be sensitive and aware uh, of that possibility, sensitive to and aware of that possibility. And then finally, I think it's important for us to remember why these alliances are, are important in the first place. You know, we're trying to make a better world, uh, and, and it's you know, a better society where as individual actors, you know, our own liberties are maximized, our own opportunities are abundant. Uh, it's, it's to make a place where we don't have to live in this fear that social conservatism might, would have us live under. Uh, because uh, you know, it's, I think it's important to be honest that that is the the, the driving um, force behind um, a, a lot of uh, social conservative policies. I think it's also important for a lot of people on the left to remember that you know the government's biggest tool is fear as well. You know, it's the fear of being put in jail if you don't pay your taxes. It's the fear of being drafted if you go to war. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of uh, fear, you know, kind of scare tactics that the government uses to keep us as citizens in line. You know, the fear of the police, fear of these drug policies, what have you. Um, it's important to be skeptical of that too, just as it's important to be skeptical of the social conservatism. Uh, so when when we have uh, these alliances, you know, I think it's just kind of important to kind of reaffirm these things uh, and, and to keep that at the forefront of our minds. Um, so with that, I've been going for about 50 minutes here, so I just want to thank everybody for, uh, for sitting through uh, with me. I hope you found uh, this conversation useful. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to maybe seeing uh, some of the questions that we're, we're going to have here during the Q&A. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Zach, and to all of our participants. Um, please type in any questions into the question box that's on your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and we have a couple questions already, so I'll start reading them off to you. Oh, wow. um, as an anarchist libertarian, I see working with the left as something to do outside of the political arena. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we're just helping them advance parts of their agenda we object to. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, well, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are definitely going to be a lot of places where it doesn't make sense to work together. Um, there are certain, uh, you know, and I think this just more generally speaking uh, kind of ties to the, the, the question of pragmatism I was talking about. And I think there are a lot of people who, um, are, are more concerned uh, with the principle, and that's fine. Um, but if it comes to, you know, part, like, look, part of my agenda is ending the drug war. Not all liberals share that part of their agenda, but uh, for me, and I think for a lot of liberals out there, that is a very important part of our agenda. And we view it probably from a different light. We don't necessarily view it as, as state oppression or needless state regulation. We view it as the fact that it's the single most uh, powerful tool that's used to oppress people of color. You go into these communities and you have uh, people of color being given these egregious uh, penalties for drug possession. And if you could take away that um, weapon, 
that the police have, then you're going to be able to to maximize, in a lot of ways, a lot of you know, quote unquote, liberal values um, when, when it comes to that front. So, uh, I mean, to answer the question, there are definitely going to be places where we're going to have disagreement, and and you won't want to enter into an alliance with somebody to advance a certain part of that agenda. And that's why I think why ballot measures in particular are so important, because it really is the singular issue focused. Um, opportunity uh, for, for these alliances to emerge. Okay, our next question. Um, have you had any experience talking with your left-leaning friends about economics and especially Austrian economics? Um, how have they reacted to those ideas? In my experience, if a left-leaning person is open to those arguments, he will join a left slash libertarian alliance. If the econ arguments don't make an impact, he will never align with us. Um, what has been your yeah, experience for, with this? <clears throat> for sure. Uh, so I think what, what this does, what, what the phenomenon you're describing here, um, reveals whether or not the person you're talking to is more interested in pragmatist, uh, and more interested in pragmatism or more interested in principles. If a person is you know, explicitly interested in like Keynesian economics, and that's the only thing um, that he or she is willing to subscribe to, then clearly that person isn't actually interested in the results of those principles. They're just interested in those principles for their own sake. And the same goes for people who, who value Austrian economics. I've found, too, that uh, you know, if these conversations are going to be explicitly um, one-sided when it comes to economics on the Austrian side, again, you're not going to have necessarily a whole lot of, of flexibility. So yeah, I've had some opportunities to talk about people on the left. You know, and, and something that I, I always I like to point out, um, you know, I, I got some friends who you know, are, are big fans of uh, Naomi Klein. She wrote the Shock Doctrine, this, this book about how um, capitalism is like destroying the world or whatever. And like, it's an interesting book, no doubt about it. And, and, and I think some of the political ideas she espouses are, are scary. Uh, to be, you know, perfectly honest, some of them also make a lot of sense. You know, there's there's a lot of material in those books. But what I like to point out to my my um, friends is that, you know, when you have these countries where, you know, supposedly um, capitalism has come in and, and destroyed everything, what you've actually seen is that you had a lack of a stable government. You didn't have a constitutional republic, uh, so to say, or so to speak. And so the the problem was not in, in these instances a lack of um, or it wasn't the problem was too much capitalism. The problem was that uh, you, you simply didn't have an effective means uh, for capitalism to operate. And if you did have this this stable uh, place for for capitalism to operate, and, and you know you had a constant democratically elected constitutional republic, um, then then you you'd be able to escape a lot of those issues that they were you know falsely attributing to to you know so-called capitalism run amok when obviously that wasn't the case. So. Um, Having these conversations uh, is very important. I, I imagine um, probably most people on the left are, are going to support um, the idea of you know government investment in things like research and infrastructure, um, to some extent probably even military spending, although I, I would hope certainly not uh, too much of that. Um, and, and, and so that's going to be a, a fine line to walk. But I also think that you'd be surprised probably by the number of, of liberals, you know, myself included, who are kind of not that kind of scared, terrified by you know the effects that quantitative easing are having on our having on our economy, where you have these um, huge institutional banks receiving crazy amounts of money at ridiculously low interest rates directly from the Fed. Like that's scary uh, for for a number of reasons, um, and and you can certainly come up with uh, some some concerns from that from a, from a liberal perspective as well. Okay, thanks, Zach. Our next question: mm -hmm. Do you think that the Occupy Wall Street could be a could be a place for an alliance? No, I think it could have been. Um, uh, un un you know, I don't think it certainly could be now. Um, you know, and then this is this is a uh, you, you know there there were there was a lot of um, I went to the Occupy uh, protests here in Iowa City, um, and and I was frustrated and I don't necessarily think this was going to be the best place to form these alliances um, for the following reason there were a lot of people who were at those Occupy protests who were um, very skeptical of business generally and a point that I kept trying to make was that no look the problem isn't business the problem is when business colludes with government um, and doesn't play by the rules it's when you have 
you know, the Secretary of Commerce, or excuse me, um, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury being a former Goldman Sachs hedge fund manager. Like, that's a problem. Um, this is that governmental business collusion. Um, but people were just blindly saying, no, 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 banks are the enemy, businesses are the enemy. And as somebody who, who works with banks and works with financial institutions in his own personal life, or excuse me, in his own professional life, I was, like, I was frustrated with that because that's simply not true. You know, banks are not evil. Banks are the reason that most people's parents have a house, right? Uh, there, there is um, not this fundamental issue with, um, with banks. There's a fundamental issue, you know, one with irresponsible loan officers, uh, and and you know, I, I think, for for example, um, the repeal of Glass Steagall was perhaps something that was not a good idea in retrospect. Um, and and there's some there's some issues there, but I, I don't think that Occupy Wall Street was a, a great opportunity and part of that is simply kind of it was all about economic issues and even though there are going to be a few choice areas within the, the realm of business and economic issues where liberals and leftists or where liberals and leftists will align with libertarians the vast majority of this, these issues I think are going to be on the social side of things and so uh, it, it might be that we don't have the opportunity to really kind of deploy these alliances in the magnitude that we would like to see until we get to a point as a country where we have a stable economy. We have a point where the conversation isn't necessarily as much about these kinds of economic issues. And, and maybe uh, we just will have to kind of bide our time a little bit until we can get to a point where social issues are, are back on the table in a, in a big way. Um, but I, I don't think these areas of, of economic issues are going to be the best places to form these alliances. Thank you. Thank you for the question. That was a good one. Thanks, Zach. Um, our next question. When it comes to things that libertarians and liberals disagree on, how can we talk about things like regulation, public choice, and the knowledge problem without making them zone out or turn on their emotional side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, to answer the second one uh, first, uh, this is so when, when we're talking about like these emotional problems, we're talking about people like playing defense. People only have to play defense when they feel like they're they're being attacked. Um, so I think if we're careful about the words we use, and, and this does take a, a great deal of effort uh, by everybody involved, um, but if we do take effort and, and care in the words that we use, I think we can have these conversations without alienating people. Um, I'm perhaps not necessarily the best person to talk to about certain ways, like phrase your, your conversation or, or anything like that. Um, but you know, try not to make assumptions about other people. Um, not necessarily uh, assume that they subscribe to certain beliefs or, or certain systems of, of thinking and anything like that. So not assuming it's going to be integral there. But as far as you know, making them not zone out, I think it's it's important for people to to get invested. Uh, and if they're invested in the conversation, they're not going to zone out. Um, now, admittedly, there, there's some more research that I have to do when it comes to public choice theory. Um, it's something that I've, I've got, seriously, like a, a reading list actually still from ISS, ISFLC that I need to go through. And I think it's, you know, and, and it's actually a, a great example of exactly what I was talking about earlier, how libertarians tend to be extraordinarily well-read. Um, so, you know, have these conversations in, in layman's terms if possible, and if not, because these are complicated, complicated kind of ideological ideas, um, then just try and, and walk people through them and, and don't necessarily try to convert them to your way of, of thinking, but help them understand why you think what you think. I think that these alliances would be much, much easier um, to form and to utilize uh, when we understand why people think what they think. Uh, because once you have the understanding of why, then you can trust that they're headed to the, towards the same thing. I think a lot of the distrust um, and, and distress that is kind of associated with some of these questions of, of ideological difference comes from the fact that people don't understand why you would, you know, want to drastically reduce the role of government. Whereas, you know, it, it's perhaps, you know, self-evident to a libertarian that by uh, reducing the role of government or the size of government, you can create more opportunities for businesses to expand, commerce to progress, and people you know, to, to rise economically and in their own standard of living. But to somebody um, who self-identifies as a liberal, that's going to seem uh, like something that's not, perhaps like somebody who's like a, a, you know, a greedy um, shareholder or what have you, simply wanting to make more profit for, it, for his own sake. And so, even though I think most people are, at the end of the day, self-interested, um, 
moving beyond these kinds of simple explanations and getting to an understanding of why we all think what we think is really, I think, the most pressing, uh, pressing issue uh, that we need to address in, in that respect. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Um, looks like we are running out of time. We still have a ton of questions, but um, we can go ahead and do one more if that's okay with you. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, as it's election season, how would you suggest approaching the topic of Ron Paul on the college camp campus, namely mm -hmm. the argument that he's a much more superior presidential candidate than Obama for liberals? Yeah, you know, I don't think you're going to find a whole lot of liberals who would agree with you in, in that respect. Um, and, <laughs> I mean, obviously I think there, there are a lot of reasons why somebody might, might think that would be true about Ron Paul um, for a liberal. Uh, and, and there are certainly a lot of, lot of places where he is better than, than Obama, especially when it comes to foreign policy. I mean, to, to be quite frank, um, even though uh, President Obama has achieved some pretty enormous accomplishments uh, in the field of foreign policy, the the uh, kind of egregious, you know, steps that he's taken in terms of uh, you know, drone strikes and then and, you know, interloping into Pakistan, um, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm glad that uh, they got bin Laden, but that was obviously a, a flagrant violation of international policy. Um, you know, in, in fact, Gitmo is still open. There, there are a lot of a lot of areas where I think liberals are definitely disgruntled with President Obama uh, in that respect. So. Um, you know that that's going to be a hard conversation to have because I don't think it's necessarily going to go anywhere. I doubt that there are very many liberals, um, and, and and that's one of the reasons why um, that's not the kind of conversation that we need to have because that's a conversion conversation. And even though uh, there are certainly um, I think some aspects that would that would be you know I would love to see Ron Paul debate President Obama in you know like a one on one uh, debate, um, but. But, but that's really you know, what, what these alliances are about. These alliances, in, in, in my mind, I think are, are more important about getting things done. Um, and, in, and I think that uh, when, when you have a viable alternative, the liberal will, will you know, lean to the liberal. Um, the libertarian will lean to the libertarian. And so these electoral politics are really, in the conversation that we're going to have in that front, are going to be more uh, pressing in a district where you have either a, uh, a very uh, kind of traditionally big government liberal uh, as opposed to an anti-authoritarian liberal um, or, or a district where you have somebody like Lamar Smith who's this a very traditional conservative um, who, who's going to have some pretty flagrant violations when it comes to social issues and that's where a libertarian is going to be much more desirable to both a liberal and a libertarian. Um, so there's self-interest uh, there but, but I don't think that that's going to be a, an easy conversation to have uh, by any stretch of the imagination um, even on a college campus. Okay, well, thank you so much, Zach, and to all of our participants this evening. We um, really apologize if we couldn't get to your question, but please feel free to continue the discussion with other participants on the Facebook event or the chat room. And I hope you can all continue. Oh, I'm sorry. It actually, you know, if you, uh, you, if you mail me a list of the questions, I might be able to, uh, to get, respond to some of those and maybe put, put those up as a, as a note or something on the, uh, on the Facebook event, because I definitely would, uh, would love to, to take a look at some of those questions and and, uh, and try and answer those if I can. Okay, well if you, um, since you have access to the Facebook group, we could do, we could have the participants post the questions on the Facebook group and perhaps you could message them or respond on the Facebook group. Will that yeah, work? Yeah, for sure, I'll do my best. I'll okay, my best. so all the questions that we couldn't get to, again apologies, um, feel free to post them on the Facebook group and let me send the link to you guys for that right now. And then um, that way we can help answer those questions that way. Let's see, one moment. And, and no guarantees that I'll be able to, to get to all the questions. i got a, a really busy week. I've, as I um, mentioned earlier, I've actually got a book coming out next week um, that I'm going to be out in, in New York City promoting. So that's going to be uh, taking up a lot of time. But I, I really do appreciate having the opportunity to come on tonight and, and have this dialogue. I think it's incredibly important to the future. Um, you know, of this generation and, uh, and even of this country that, you know, at the risk of sounding somewhat grandiose, um, I think these alliances are, are going to be an important part of, of moving uh, the, the conversation at a national level. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Zach. And again, thank you all to, our, to all of our participants. Um, and our next webinar is actually next Wednesday, April 25th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time um, with Bruce Benson on 
Yes, Virginia, there is a law merchant, which will outline the evolution of law without the state and answer the recent arguments on the myth of the law merchant. And to register, please visit our website, studentsforliberty.org. Um, on a final note, shortly you will receive a follow-up email where you will find more detailed information about SFL in our next webinar. You'll also receive a survey to evaluate the webinar. Please take a couple of minutes to fill it out. It helps us know how to improve our programs and makes these webinars more interesting for you. And with that, I think we're officially wrapped up. Thank you again for your time this evening, and have a wonderful night, everyone. And thanks again, Zach. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, guys.